Foxhole is a war game with a great deal of complexity and very little guidance on how to play. There's some impressive depth to this one, so let's take a look at how to get started. When you first log into Foxhole, you'll be asked to pick a faction. The Colonials are a proud militaristic republic with green uniforms, usually referred to as Collies. The Wardens are a more imperial style faction with a darker aesthetic and a desire to restore the glory of their empire. Or blueberries for short. <laughs> I think the art generator might have picked a favorite. Oof. Now once you choose a faction, you'll be locked into that faction until the current war ends. They both play a little differently. Wardens operate out of a snowy climate with Collies playing in the rainy muddy regions. Each faction has a different set of weapons and vehicles, so there are some strengths and weaknesses for each. I definitely recommend playing both at least once before committing to a favorite. Once you've made your selection and every time you log into the game you restart in the deployment zone. This has several tutorial areas where you can play some of the mechanics before you jump in. Press M to open your map. You'll see various different training courses outlined. While the area is missing a lot of the newer stuff, there is some value in messing around with the controls and vehicles to get the hang of things. Most things happen pretty fast in this game, so I recommend the use of voice comms. By default, you'll press T to talk, T to talk, and G will talk only in your current squad, T to squad talk. You can also hit enter to type in chat, using the tab key to change the specific channel you want to talk to. You can create a squad on the side over here, give it a name, and make it public or private with the little lock icon. The squad is like a small group, only you can actually be a member of several squads at a time. You just have to decide which one is active at any given moment. Regiments are the clan system of the game and you can only be a member of a single regiment at a time. You can also communicate with a callout menu by pressing H, choose the command, and pointing to where you want to make the callout. This one's handy for positional callouts. You'll move around with the standard WASD keys. You'll hit C to crouch, X to go prone, and pressing shift will toggle your run, or hold shift if you have toggle turned off. Your stamina bar will drain the more you run, so keep an eye out. Right clicking will look if you're empty handed, it'll aim if you have a weapon equipped, and left click will use what's in your active hand. If it's a gun, it'll shoot, if it's a hammer, it'll swing, and so on. And middle mouse will rotate the camera. To climb up something or jump over it, press spacebar while facing it. Pressing tab gets you the inventory screen. Everything on the top is what you have equipped and the bottom is your inventory. You get progressively slower the more you carry, so really want to stay light. You can see your total weight at the top right of your inventory. This game doesn't wait until 100% to apply a movement penalty. You'll move slower at 70% than you did at 40% and so on. More weight also drains your running stamina faster too, so plan your load out accordingly. Now your equipped item slots are locked to specific item types. Honestly, it'll just take some experience to learn which items are locked to each slot. Generally, slot 1 always holds a main hand item like a machine gun or a hammer. The second slot will hold backup items, typically a pistol. And the third slot will hold an auxiliary item like grenades or a bandage. And you have this attachment slot that always attaches to the item in slot 1. This is usually a bayonet or a grenade launcher attachment. You're going to actively equip those slots into your hand by using the relevant number key. So hit 1 to equip that hammer, 2 for the pistol, and 3 for whatever might be in the third slot. Hit the key again to holster that item. And hit the F key to equip your attachment onto your slot 1 item. On the top right you'll find your gear. The uniform you wear changes the rules for your kit. They typically change the weight of items relevant to that role, and allow items to stack that might not have otherwise. For example, a medic uniform lets bandages stack and reduces the weight of the medic and trauma kit. There are utility items that go in these other slots, but we'll go over those in a bit. Now anytime you approach something you can interact with, you'll see a context command show up in the bottom left corner. It's worth noting that anytime you're standing somewhere that multiple interaction points are available, the game's hitbox can be a little bit tricky about giving you the interaction you wanted. In these cases, clicking shift with the interaction key will give you a list of options. For example, standing between this truck and trailer, Shift E lets me choose whether I want to open the back of the truck or hitch the trailer. But you can see from the corner that it would have opened the truck if I would just hit E. You can also get an interaction window on a player by holding the Alt key and clicking on them. This is especially handy for giving commands to the medic that just saved your life. Speaking of which, the rank beside your name gives player an indication of how seasoned you are in this game. 
that rank goes up when players give you the required number of commins to rank up. So doing good deeds and earning player commins will give you higher ranks. The rank doesn't actually provide any functional value other than bragging rights. The best and most reliable way to earn these is by making logistics deliveries to frontline bases. We'll cover that more in a bit. You can also hit F1 to open a menu showing all the players in your region, in case you didn't come in that medic fast enough, as well as a few pieces of information at the top about your own character. From the deployment zone, you'll want to follow the deployment directions on the road, or find the deployment point on the map. And once you reach that area, you'll see that interaction command we talked about. Now all the blue area belongs to the wardens and the green to the collies. Each hex on the map is a dedicated server instance with a limited population. The blinking areas are the hotspots of combat activity. Pick one of these and preferably one that doesn't have a queue. Once that hex server is full, you'll be put into a queue to join. And anyone with a truck full of supplies at the border wanting in will get priority over others, possibly bumping your position in line. Once you deploy, you'll have access to more information on your map. The intelligence icons show you where soldiers, vehicles, and combat buildings are located. This only updates when you interact with a base. You can get this information to update constantly while in the field if you're carrying a radio. So it's important to have this radio if you're delivering frontline supplies or commanding a combat vehicle. And that information only goes on the map if it's within range of an observation tower or other equipment that provides intel. You can see where that intel is by looking at these little rings around the objects. Many of the icons on the map have tooltips to help you determine what's there. The white resource icons will show you how many resources are left in the field. Resource mines will show you resources, but they also show fuel, as they need fuel to constantly produce those resources passively. Keep an eye out for useful notes that might warn you about enemy activity, provide a list of needed supplies, or just offer a friendly reminder to leave trucks unlocked when you log out. You can filter these items by unchecking them. Now there are two types of mass storage buildings, the seaport and the storage depot. Mousing over them will show you the items inside. With the exception of vehicles, everything you see in these buildings will be stored as crates, meaning you can't use the items directly until that crate's been unpacked at a base. These buildings exist to provide bulk storage for a region, so frontline logi drivers can deliver supplies from here to the bases that need them. And then we have those bases. These come in various forms, town halls, safe houses, relic bases that are more remote, and even player-built bunkers. This is where those crates get unpacked into usable items, and this is where you'll equip yourself for the fight. The bases are colored according to which faction controls it, and white structures are either neutral resources or destroyed buildings. To take over these regions, players have to destroy the enemy building and then rebuild it for themselves. Getting your hands on a vehicle can be a hassle sometimes. You can check stockpiles and seaports for public ones. If there is one, you can just click it to pull it out. Many towns will have a public parking lot with a few vehicles. And if you still can't find one, you need to take some BMATs to a garage. Sometimes you'll get lucky and an awesome Logi player will have left BMATs in the garage for just such an occasion. Access the garage menu, find your vehicle, and start hammering all those BMATs into it. If you built the vehicle yourself, you'll notice the interaction menu, there's a reservable icon. This means you can actually submit this vehicle to a personal stockpile. Very handy for keeping vehicles in a town you operate out of every time you play. When you are done with it, you can leave it in one of those parking lots, just make sure it's unlocked. Or you can submit it to a stockpile with the submit button. All the fuel in the vehicle will be lost and it must be fully repaired before doing so. When you enter a vehicle, you can hit the Z key to change seats, or hit control and a number key to switch to a specific seat. One is usually the driver, two is the main gunner if the vehicle has one, and they vary after that. You can also get out and interact with the vehicle, change its fuel type with the button, which will refund the current fuel back to you. And to refuel, just equip the can, hit 3 to pull it out, and left click toward the vehicle to fill it. You can also lock the vehicle with the L key. You can do this either from the interaction zone or from inside the vehicle. This keeps others from messing with your vehicle, but there's a time limit. Once you've left the vehicle for a bit, it can be unlocked with a wrench. Most of the time you pick up a vehicle from a seaport or a storage depot, a friendly Logi player will have left a large liquid container full of diesel. From the truck interaction menu, click the refuel from the nearby container button, and a hose will drop out and fuel you up. 
Many vehicles also have a special interaction key. This is usually F, and in the case of this boat, it'll open the ramp so you can offload. All right, you've made it to a front line. Now the front does occasionally have that angry armchair general condescendingly yelling at everyone to do what they say and do it right now. Just try not to take that idiocy personally. Sometimes they have good advice just delivered with a troll's voice. This is a competitive combat game after all, and you know how mature the internet is. I will say that this game has a far more cooperative community than most online games I've played, and your interactions are generally going to be more positive than the average MMO. But since you can't put more than 20 people in a room without at least one troll, they will be here. Alright, back to shooting the baddies. This game doesn't really tell you what you need to be doing. It's a non-stop trench war, so for starters, I would just hit the front line with a basic infantry kit and start getting a feel for the game. Once you get a deeper understanding of the game, you start learning what types of activities move the needle on the front line and how you can help push that goal. Access the base you spawned at using that context clue we mentioned. Anytime you get to a new base, make sure to use the home key to set your spawn point so that this is the point you come back to every time you die. Now let's see what weapons are available for the fight. On your first deployments, I would just take a rifle and maybe two clips. You're going to die, and the more you're carrying, the more supplies are lost when you do. Grab an item out of the stockpile by clicking on it. If you grab something you didn't want, you can right-click it and submit it back to the stockpile. Make sure the ammo you're grabbing is the right type for the gun you're using. It's also a good idea to carry a single bandage in case you're hit without a medic nearby. And just leave your standard infantry uniform on for this run. There are categories of items at the top of the stockpile, ranging from small arms, utility, medical gear, and so on. In the medical tab, you'll see an item called soldier supplies. In the game, we just call them shirts. Each time you die and respawn, you'll consume one of those shirts. That's a limit on how many lives can be lost out of this base, and you'll rely on players to restock that supply. Once you have what you need, don't forget to open the inventory and equip everything you grabbed by clicking each one of them. And remember, hotkeys one through three will unholster those items. So make sure you pull out any guns, hit R for reload to load that first clip. You can also submit your starting equipment back to reduce your carry weight. Either right click each item that you don't want, or click this button to submit the whole starter kit back. As a side note here, reloading your guns discards what was already in it, so you'll lose those rounds if you reload with a half clip still in. Sometimes it's better to lose three rounds than be caught reloading in a firefight, but don't take one or two shots and reload like you would in Halo. Anytime a town is taken or a new bunker is built, there's a list of upgrades that have to be unlocked before they're usable. These upgrades are unlocked by each player that votes for one, so make sure to vote anytime you access a base or a bunker that isn't fully unlocked. Okay, rule number one for leaving the base. You drain less stamina by running on the road. You also die by running in the middle of the road. Any and all vehicle drivers will run you over. Don't be in the middle of the road. Your view distance in this game is sometimes the same distance it takes to stop a truck at full speed. So even if the driver tries, they may not be able to avoid hitting you. And many drivers won't care. This is especially true for tanks. That tank may look like great cover from the enemy, but that tank driver is not going to risk his expensive tank to save the shirt that's lost when he runs you over. He will run you over if he needs to back out of a dangerous spot. Never be behind a tank. And don't take it personally when they do run you over, it was probably worth it. And I apologize for the lack of tank crushing footage. Usually there's plenty of that to go around, but the war just changed and tanks are not unlocked yet. Now when you aim, there's a small reticle that closes in over time. The tighter that reticle, the less randomness that goes into the direction of the bullet. That reticle tightens faster or slower depending on the weapon you're using. It'll go in faster when you're crouched or even faster when prone. And it goes in slower if you're actively moving while aiming. If you get behind cover, you'll see a shield icon. This cover provides a chance that a bullet that would have hit you will instead hit the cover. Being in cover also speeds up your aiming time. So use trenches, walls, trees, and foxholes as cover when you can. You can also crouch behind some cover to become fully invisible to the enemy. But if they can't see you, then you probably can't see them. This game only shows you things your character can see, so don't forget to check your six often. If you get hit, you may see a bleeding icon. This is a timer for your death. Either use that bandage you're carrying to patch yourself up or find a medic to heal you. If you did grab that bandage, just hit three to pull it out and left click to start applying it to yourself. 
You can build many structures in the game. Pull out your hammer and hit B to open the build menu. The first tab is the defense menu, and it'll tell you what materials are needed to build each item. The observation tower is a very handy one for making sure information is available on the map. When placing it, you can hold the right mouse button down to rotate. And the pillboxes provide an AI-controlled defense that can fire at the enemy even when you aren't around. For this AI to be active, it needs to be within 150 meters of a supply base. You can tell if it is while trying to build it. Now when you're approaching AI, you know it's active when there's a full flag flying above it. A partial flag shows that the AI has been disabled, most likely because the base controlling it has been destroyed. Or someone just built it out of range of a base. Now one thing that's really easy to miss is that you can actually enter these pillboxes with Q and fire from them. It's a great defensive position on a front line. The base tab in the build menu lets you build a few utility items like mobile cranes and construction vehicles. That construction vehicle, or CV for short, has its own advanced build menu that we won't get into here, but just know that it's needed to rebuild towns after they've been destroyed. Bunkers and facilities make up the bulk of what's left in the build menu. Those are entirely different rabbit holes, so I'll save those for more advanced guides. In the town centers, you'll see a hammer for refineries where raw resources are produced into refined resources, factories where those refined resources are turned into manufactured goods, stockpiles and seaports that store the crates of manufactured goods, and finally many variations of frontline deployment bases where those crates of goods can be dropped off and unpacked into the actual items you equip. You can collect scrap and coal with the basic hammer. All other resources require the sledgehammer, and it provides more resources per swing anyways. And ideally, you want this harvester, which collects very quickly and stores resources until it's full. But most importantly, remember to always leave the harvester unlocked and at the resource fields. Drive the resources back in the truck and let the next person use the harvester. To collect the materials without the manual labor, you can drive up to a mining machine. Shift-click the resources to assemble three orders at a time. Typically, someone will have a fuel tank next to the mine, so be sure to hit the refuel button before you leave. The mine operates much faster on petrol than it does on diesel. The only downfall to getting materials this way is that there's no chance for the rare metals. Those are only found in fields. Once you have the resources, head to a refinery. It's that hammer icon on the map. And once you're within range, you can interact with it while still in the truck. There are a handful of recipes listed here. At the top, you can choose if your production will be personal or public. Public orders will go straight into the stockpile for anyone to use and private can only be collected by you. By now you may have noticed that there is an assembly time when pulling items out of stockpiles. If you plan to use the resources yourself, leave them private. Your assembly time is instant in the refinery for private materials. Single click the resource side to produce one single item. Right click and submit to choose a quantity or just shift click to submit them all. You may also notice an expiration time on the bottom of the refine panel. That's how long you have to claim these private resources before they get moved into the public stockpile. Every time you submit a new production order though, that timer will be reset. Occasionally you'll run across these rare metals or specific metals like copper and iron. The specific metals are used for research and the rare metals are used in the construction of large ships. For a new player, I would just leave them in the refinery for someone more experienced to take care of. As for what to make, the basic materials on the top are known as B-mats. This is the most common item. It's used for the majority of defensive constructions, a lot of the basic vehicles, and it's used along with the hammer to repair damages on just about everything that can be damaged. It's also the ingredient for a lot of the basic goods in the factory. Next is diesel, and it's the basic fuel of the game. You always need plenty of that. Explosive materials, or E-mats, go into the basic grenades and infantry explosives. All three of those are made from scrap. Next is refined materials or R mats, and those are made from components. They're more rare than salvage, and this material goes into making the more advanced, really fun stuff like tanks and grenade launchers. Sulfur is used to make heavy explosive materials. This is needed for the really big booms, artillery shells and the like. Coal is used to make gravel, and that's only for player-made facility pads. You won't need to worry about that just yet. 
And the last three are the research alloys. They go into producing prototype kits at an engineering center, which is part of the whole research unlock process. Okay, now that you have some refined materials, find a factory on the map. We're gonna take them there. In this case, we're gonna make some shirts. Change to the category and mouse over the item to see the cost. Then choose how many you'd like to queue up. You'll notice the items showing up on the right side. I can see the total cost and time needed to produce the order. You can also make this order personal or public, but you can only queue up four items in this category. For efficiency, it's ideal to queue up items in several categories. Your order may also be queued behind someone else's, which may bump up the time a bit. To take delivery of your order, just click the arrow and move them into the truck. And since I had a few materials left over, I'll leave them in the building for the next person to use. Now you can deliver those to a storage facility or a seaport. Keep in mind, these items are in crates of multiples and are not currently usable. When you drive up to a storage building, you can once again choose how to store the crates. If you want to make these private, you'll need to click the plus icon to create a new private stockpile. Once you do, you'll find it shows up in the dropdown. Now all you got to do is right click to submit your items to that stockpile. Keep in mind, once again, these pull a lot faster from private stock than they do from public. And just like the refinery, there's a time limit on how long you can keep these private before they go public. But as long as you get back before the timer expires, you can refresh that timer with this button. And now the fun part, delivering these to a frontline base. Make sure you have a radio so you can check for intel that might show you enemies on the road. Choose a path that is safe. You don't want to lose all this hard work. And keep an eye on the map often. People will leave notes if roads are compromised, and the front might even move before you get there. Once you pull up to the base you're dropping off at, you can submit them all and the crates will automatically be unpacked into individual items. Now this is typically where you get your commands. Anyone spawning from this base will see the message that you made the Logi drop, and they get an automatic easy click option to commend you for it. Now the logistics side of this game goes much deeper than we've covered, but it's way too much to pack into this video. Keep an eye out for an advanced Logi video to dive deeper into this topic. Now I know this guide was like drinking water from a fire hose. This game has a lot of information and can be pretty complicated, but it's pretty damn interesting as well. And it has a lot of depth. At any rate, if you made it this far, hit the like button and happy hunting, soldier.